and then start. But in case you're wondering what room you've come into, this is the member seminar on uncomfortable truths, engaging development and global health through the BLDS legacy collection. Um, I'll just begin by saying who we have in the room with us today as you're joining, um, because we, we do sort of have a tight, we have a lot of material that we want to cover. Um, first, I should introduce myself. My name is Erica Nelson. I'm a, a postdoc research fellow in the health and nutrition cluster. Although um, in the last couple of years, I've also been wearing a dual hat of being a, a research fellow at the Center for History and Public Health at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. And I share that information because that explains um, how Leoba has come to join us today. So we are joined today by my colleague from LSHTM, Leoba Hirsch, who has been um, actively involved in the Decolonizing Global Health a Steering Group at LSHTM, as well as running the Colonial, Colonial History Research Project. Um, which is sort of in, involved in interrogation of the LSHTM archives. And we've brought her today to talk about that experience um, with the idea that it's going to help inform sort of how we think about institutionally our relationship to the BLDS legacy collection. We also have Danny Millam, who is, as you can see, actually physically in the BLDS archives or the legacy collection. Um, that is not a screensaver background, that he, he is actually there and he's going to speak to us about um, some of the work that they've been doing. Um, and we have Jeremy Alouche, who is also a member of the BLDS Steering Committee, along with myself and um, Melissa and Haley, um, who are hopefully in the room with us. Um, and we are, um, yeah, collectively going to share sort of a general enthusiasm for this project, but also uh, the opportunities it is going to bring in terms of critical debates related to both decolonizing global health and development. Um, and just, you know, critical debates about the role of history in contemporary practice more generally. So I'm not going to say a whole lot more now because I'm going to say a lot later. I want to turn it over to Leoba, who's going to um, share with us some of her reflections coming out of sort of both the moment in time in which she's been tasked with looking at LSHTM's colonial history and um, yeah, the meaning, the meaning making of that process and how it how it's relevant to um, some of these critical debates that are going on in the both in higher education, but in sort of the practice of development and global health more broadly. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Leoba. Thank you for joining us. No, thank you so much for inviting me, Erica. And it's um, such a pleasure to be with you all, even if only virtually. Um, I really hope you haven't oversold my presentation, Erica. Um, but yeah, as Erica said, I'm a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where I um, have had the honor of, of uh, researching the school's colonial history um, over the last year and a half. And so um, what I'm going to do is just share some, some reflections around the project itself, but also um, the process. I hope you can all see the slides. Perfect, thanks. Um, Yep. Um, yeah, so um, just some background information to start. Um, the LSHM Colonial History Project was sort of conceived as a one year project to look into the school's co colonial history specifically, um, rather than its history more generally, um, and um, to cover the period between 1899 when the school was founded and 1960, which was sort of, it's, it's a bit of an arbitrary date. But I think it's broadly conceived to, to sort of signify the end of colonialism. Um, the school, the school's founding is, 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 is very intricately linked with British colonialism, in that um, the school was founded in 1899 by um, the colonial office, and most of the money for the school came from the colonial office and came from colonial governments. So um, sort of colonial exploitation across the British Empire um, and, and, and the funds that were derived um, from that um, were directly used to set up the London School of Hygiene. Um, and I've written here that the project examined LSHM's colonial entanglements, and I really like this word, um, entanglements, and, and probably overuse it, but I think it's really useful because in the archives, the colonial context is, is very rarely front and center. It simmers in the background, and then needs to be deduced and, and, and unearthed and, and, and foregrounded um, sort of through, through active archival research and work. Um, and um, I'll talk about that a little bit later if I have time. Um, 
I also thought it'd be really good, and the discussion that I had with, with Erica before um, if coming here today, um, she said that it, it might be really good to sort of talk a little bit about the, I guess, the, the personal um, challenges or, or, or maybe the political challenges of doing such a research project and of being tasked with looking at quite an uncomfortable history um, in your current workplace and what that entails. Um, and um, so, in, I mean, I'm still doing the project now, but um, have had some time to reflect. And um, I would argue that the challenges of such a project are, are both logistical in terms of how the project is set up, but they're also political in terms of what the institution wants from such a project, but and, and very much emotional for the researcher or the researchers who are involved in, in doing this and, and carry this work. And I would argue that's especially the case for, for people of color who are often tasked with, with yeah, sort of whipping, whipping um, institutions into shape in terms of overcoming their colonial histories today. Um, and I think one of the reasons why, why, why all of these challenges present themselves is because institutional intuitions are almost always directed towards protecting the status quo. And so even if organizations sort of like, um, I guess, dedicate the funds to, to engage in a, in, in a critical colonial history, I would argue that it's, it's been my experience that, that they're not always sure what they've sort of, what, what, what process that they've entered into and, and, and dealing with that and sort of getting institutions to get onto the same page and, and to, to deal with the legacies of colonialism. Um, quite often falls onto onto the shoulders of the researcher who who, who works on this. Um, another thing that that um, I've, I've I've dealt with quite a bit, I think, is a sort of the or that I would like to talk about are the dangers of, but also what I would call but alsoism, which is when you present people with uncomfortable histories and then say, yeah, but also there was also this and that, and then present you with with or, or sort of like urge you to embrace more positive facets of of an institutional history. Um, in, 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 I guess, in an urge or in, 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 in a call for balanced histories. And um, uh, I, I was going through these slides earlier and it reminded me of this, one of those many proverbs that are sort of like generally called African proverbs. Um, but uh, what I was thinking of was, was this, um, the saying that until the lion learns to write, every story is going to glorify the hunter. And I think that's really important because histories have never been balanced. And so the fact that that critical colonial histories are now being confronted with this idea that we need balanced histories is a really dangerous one. All right, um, so history of global health, I would argue really starts with colonial health and colonial health itself really starts with, with tropical medicine and tropical medicine starts with this man, Patrick Manson, the founder of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who I've come to know um, intimately through his writings in the archives. And what I want to do here is just start by, um, by, by telling you LSHDM's history as it was told by its, by its founders and, and the men and that they were exclusively white men who set up the school and who, who shaped its, 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 its development in, in the early period. And so this is a quote um, from Patrick Manson from a speech that he gave in 1912 at a fundraiser for the school. And I'm just going to read that out and then read out a few more quotes. In the 80s and 90s, just when the new era in tropical medicine was commencing, the British Empire was undergoing one of its periodical expansions, this time principally in Africa, and just note the, the, the beautiful way in which colonialism is described here as a periodical expansion. Vast areas were being added to the empire, northern and southern Nigeria, U U Uganda, British East Africa, Nyasa land, the huge territory included under the name Rhodesia, the Burr states, and in a sense, the Egyptian Sudan. As a consequence of this expansion, important problems in administration kept cropping up for our statesmen to grapple with, none more important than those entailed by the unhealthiness of many of the countries I have mentioned. Indeed, this matter of health was a very old problem in African administration and one hitherto unsolved. Tropical Africa, like so many tropical countries, though politically potentially rich, is under present conditions a poor country. For this, the unenterprising character of the native and the relatively scanty population may in part be responsible, but undoubtedly the main reason is the unhealthiness of the climate. And so obviously what Manson does here is he describes the political conditions which, which led to the, the formation um, of the London School of, of, of Tropical Medicine, as it was called until 1924, um, when it sort of incorporated this public health aspect and added the hygiene to its name. Um, 
the first students arrived um, at the London School on the 2nd of October 1899, which is when its first session um, started, and Manson welcomed them with the, first, uh, with the following words. You're welcome for many reasons, but more especially because you are the first installment of what we hope will grow in the course of years into a numerous and important band. A band that shall not, shall not only leave its mark in the history of topical medicine, but shall exercise an influence for good in the development of the empire. And I think this is a really interesting quote because it's, it sort of signifies what dealing with, with colonial archives um, allows us to do in the sense that the people who wrote the texts that are contained in those archives very rarely minced words. And um, the fact that, he, that Manson so openly um, 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 stated what the, what the purpose of the, of the um, London School of Tropical Medicine was, is really useful now because it allows us to, to point to, I guess, the pervasiveness of colonialism um, in, in, in the school's history. Um, and I also thought this would be interesting because it's one example in which tropical medicine and development are linked from the beginning. This quote is by Andrew Balfour, who becomes the school's director in 1925. Um, he works for the Wellcome Trust, actually, um, in uh, Sudan, in Khartoum, um, in the 1920s, before joining the school. Um, and this is from a paper called Acclimatization of the White Man in the Tropics. And in it, he says, what we have to ask ourselves is, can white men live and work and breed and in the true sense, colonize the tropics if these regions are freed from disease? In other words, do tropical climatic conditions and what we may call the general conditions of life in the tropics pre present an insuperable barrier to the white man making a permanent home therein and to his descendants exhibiting that bodily and mental vigor, which at the present day is a special characteristic or hallmark as it were of the Caucasian races. So obviously racism is also really pervasive in the archives. Um, this is another um, um, paper that he wrote. Um, I'm not going to read out the quote, um, but in it essentially he links the, um, the, the development of treatment for hookworm infection to, um, to uh, an increase or, or the possibility of an increase in labor exploitation in East Africa. And this is one of the ways in which the history of the London School and, and the teaching and the research that the London School undertook um, directly linked into and, and furthered um, British colonial expansion and the exploitation of indigenous workforces. Um, I thought that because we had IDS, I'd sort of like link colonial medicine and, and this notion of development. And I think what's really interesting in the archives is that from the beginning, health and tropical medicine are tied to the notion of development. And development in the archives coincides with white British and colonial interests and those of white settlers. And that's really important that the notion of whiteness is not hidden in the archives and it's sort of like more front and center than it is in a lot of conversations today, I would argue. The notion of development as it's written in the archives relies on notions of white superiority and more advanced intellectual, socioeconomic and physical development as, um, as, as, as sort of illustrated in the Manson quote and in, and in the Balfour quotes. Um, and I did the presentation and I thought, okay, why have I chosen to present so many examples of racism in the archives? And I think one of the main reasons is because I think that we need to learn to be uncomfortable and 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 I think quite often people have a tendency to think of racism as sort of an individual or an individualized occasional occurrence and and what we need to understand is that it's everywhere it's incredibly pervasive and it shapes how the archives were were put together how they're structured and how we read and encounter them today so how do we use colonial archives um how do we tell uncomfortable histories um, of, of or about our own workplace? Um, as I've said at the beginning, um, projects which rely on colonial archives come with a lot of emotional challenges. And I would argue that that's especially the case for the researcher who undertakes this project. Um, there's a lot I could say about precarity and who is being tasked with doing this work, which maybe we can get to in the, um, in the, in, in, in the Q and A later in the conversation. But what's really important is that for such projects to be successful and for researchers to, to feel supported and to be able to do this, this project in, I guess, as good a way as possible, um, um, these projects require um, emotional support from line managers. And again, I think that's something that's not always sort of like that people don't always realize when they set up these projects. Um, as I said at the beginning, quite often there's an institutional disconnect between wanting critical histories and relating histories to current work practices and dynamics and the institutional makeup. And again, I think that's 
that's that's really important that histories are not only in the past histories shape our present and shape how institutions are set up today and how we can work in, in the institutions in which we work and yeah again relatedly racist histories are often one thing but then racist racist presence or, or, or the idea that that the present is shaped by racism is another one that people sort of shy away from um, LSHGM has contributed to improving health worldwide, which is its motto, um, while also benefiting from and furthering colonial exploitation and racial discrimination. And I think sitting with the discomfort that both can coexist at the same time um, and, and shape our present is really, really important. Um, yeah, and I think there's more to be said about positionality um, and, and, and knowing when to intervene and when to be silent. And, and I think the importance of not being an expert is something that um, I'd love to discuss with you, but I'm going to, in the interest of time, move on. Um, so, um, yeah, I wanted to, to, to have a slide on, on responsible histories or, or what I think responsible histories are. And, and, and I've done this because I think that history needs to be used and can be used responsibly. It's a really powerful tool to right past wrongs um, and, and, and contribute to, to more equitable um, 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 contemporary societies. I've, I've uh, had a moan about a balance, what this notion of balanced history is at the beginning. Um, but again, I would argue that balanced history is not a contemporary telling of history that balances the good and the bad legacies of colonialism, because we've only been told the good version of colonial history for far too long. And so to provide a balanced account of history, we need radically honest anti-colonial histories, which are written to address past injustice, both epistemic and societal. Um, and responsible histories of colonialism are deeply uncomfortable histories of colonialism. And I would argue that we especially need those because of those graphs and the, the headline that I've, that I've pulled out there on the left, um, which are based on, on, I think, one or two um, YouGov um, surveys into um, British attitudes towards colonialism and colonial histories and the fact that um, a, a majority uh, or around 30% of British people are proud of the British Empire and another 30 or 37% um, say that it's neither something to be proud of or proud of or ashamed of. And again, I think that's that's something that, that really needs to change. Um, so just to conclude, um, I, I sort of um, thought I, I and I really don't like this idea of a toolkit, and I don't think we can have a toolkit um, to, 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 to decolonize archives or decolonize histories. Um, but I think it's important to use archives as an anti-colonial tool. And I think we need to ask ourselves certain questions. And the first is, what's the use of the archive? How were archives set up? With, with which purpose? What did people who, who, who handed their, their collections over to an institution have in mind? Why did they want those, those, those documents and letters and, and, um, and um, communications and meeting minutes passed on to for future generations? And I think that's a really important question. Um, we linked to that, what did the authors want us to see? And um, a really good example in the LSHTM archives is that of the Ronald Ross collection. And Ronald Ross he was the scientist who, um, who proved that malaria is being transmitted um, by mosquitoes. And Ross, before handing over his, his, his archive to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, curated his collection and, and, and stipulated how um, the collection should be catalogued um, within the archives. I think it's important um, to recognize that um, racism and coloniality are inherent in LSHGM archives and they're inherent in a majority of archives, I would argue. Um, the other archive that I've worked with quite a lot is that of the, um, the, is, uh, the national archives and, and I would argue that's definitely the same there. As I've said, historical work comes with methodological responsibilities. Um, and I think as such, it's important to draw, draw out and focus on marginalized voices in the archives because archives, the archives that I've worked with are, 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 are dominated by, by white men and, and their racist views. And we need to showcase the conflations of medical science and projects of white supremacy in the present if we want to use archives as an anti-colonial tool. Um, and then finally, I think that links into considering um, implications for global health interventions in the present. And I would argue that that's probably the same with development. But I'll stop there and I'll stop sharing um, and pass back to Erica or to Daniel. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and um, yeah, hopefully we can discuss this later on. Thanks very much, Leoba. So that was really, really fascinating. I'd love to see what you made of our collections as well. And hopefully sometime uh, post-COVID, you'll be able to come down and have a look at those. So 
I'm going to speak um, a little more briefly than that and just to basically introduce the British Library for Development Studies Legacy Collection and the project as well. Um, basically, um, the BLDS Legacy Collection is located at the moment in the basement of the Institute of Development Studies, um, and it tracks the unfolding story of international development and health systems in the global south over the last half century. And the main work of the BLDS Legacy Collection project is to make these materials, uh, which are diverse but interrelated, accessible and user friendly um, through cataloguing, through tagging them, through cross referencing them, um, and basically helping to introduce them to a wider audience of researchers and helping them better understand the individual elements of the collection, but the collection as a whole as well. And the entire collection comprises over a million items. Uh, and that includes a bunch of different types of material. Um, there's a huge amount of government and international agency reports and statistics. Um, there's a lot of pamphlets by civil society actors, research institutions, political parties. Um, there are documents from participatory and community-based research, which obviously was a big feature of IDS. Um, and there are large runs of serials and related books as well. Uh, there's also guidelines for digging your own pit latrine if you need them. Um, so the collection is one of the most comprehensive in the world in its coverage of government and official sources, particularly those published in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia between the mid 60s and the mid 90s. And it also features selective coverage of other countries that were key sites of development and health research and innovation during this time. And that includes the Middle East, Francophone Africa, North Africa and South and Central America. And its value um, lies both in the breadth and scope of its contents, but also in the fact that the collection primarily comes from low and middle income countries. So they may have limited funds, there may have been civil conflict, there may have been environmental disasters, there may have been neglect, which has led to substantial archival destruction. So it may well be that we have holdings that don't exist in the countries themselves from which they've come. Um, so relevant to the seminar that we, we're um, at today, when we first started to catalogue the collection, we almost immediately realised that for nearly every country we came across, there were substantial holdings of materials that related to family planning. And once you start comparing countries, you can see the same motifs promoting the nuclear family appear in material that's published across the global south. Um, this is just an effect of PowerPoint. This is not how we keep the materials. They're all in pristine condition, I promise. Uh, as well as those more aesthetically appealing items, nearly every country also has a huge run of population censuses, uh, mostly from the 1960s onwards, uh, which ask a variety of increasingly sophisticated questions. Um, and so, uh, so we, I spoke to Erica before this, and we made some rough calculations. Um, and of the material that we've catalogued so far, uh, we would say that at least 20 to 30% of that consists of censuses. Um, and so, in many instances, we think that these censuses may no longer be extant in the countries from which they've come. And again, the more that we can make those available to researchers, the more that, however dry they look on the outside, there's all manner of fascinating information inside. So one of the aims of our project is to promote particular strengths of the collection. And so that's why we thought that the, uh, the idea of the workshop, the seminar today, was a really great example that this can highlight how researchers might use the collection in this instance to study the historical context and meaning of population policy, demographic studies and family planning studies. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Erica, who's going to speak in detail about this. Um, but if anybody afterwards is interested at all in either the collection or interested in the project and how we're conducting it, then do just drop us a line. Uh, you can get us on the email, bldslegacy at sussex.ac.uk. We'd be happy to answer any questions. And as soon as it's possible as well, we would be happy for people to uh, contact us in advance and arrange um, a visit or arrange to see some selected items from the, of, of our material. So I'm going to hand you back to Erica now. Thanks very much. OK, give me a second to share my screen now as well. Um, thank you both. This is really interesting. I'm finding this really interesting. I'm hoping the people in the room are also finding this really interesting um, because I, I, I guess when Danny and I talked about it and when I thought, oh, I th you know, I'd really like to hear Leoba talk about her experience um, is because, you know, I, I'm coming at this project as as a historian of the time period in which a lot of the materials in the BLDS collection consist, you know, this sort of 60s to 90s, um, 
historical period, but I but I haven't actually researched much in the archive in the legacy collection because it was sort of just beginning to be um, turned over to this project at the point that I joined IDS. I, I put my nose down there a few times, you know, but I, I wasn't able to do any sort of intensive or substantial research. So what I'm going to talk about more now, sort of um, picking up a little bit of both what, what Danny just presented in terms of what, what is actually living in the basement of IDS, but as well as what Leobas talked about, what are the responsibilities of engaging with contentious histories and, and the sort of frank recognition that, you know, that IDS isn't came to, into its existence at a point in which, um, you know, out of a colonial moment, but into a post-independence moment. So it is, and what does, what does this sort of like early period of development tell us about some of the dominant frameworks at the time? And as Danny just mentioned, um, there's an awful lot of material on family planning and population. So why is that? Well, I'm gonna um, take you back on a little bit of a, it's sort of a personal history, or it's a personal history of my engagement with history, um, because I've actually been looking at these issues of, the politics of population, of sexual reproductive health, of family planning, um, the politics of race and gender, and the and the kind of ways in which uh, things from a, a colonial or an imperial moment, because I've, I've done a lot more work on Latin American history, so we're looking at sort of imperial relations or neo-imperial relations with the U.S., how they sort of bled into more contemporary moments, despite what people might have wanted to uh, present their sort of contemporary development work as. And so I'm just going to give you a set of vignettes here to start things off, and then I'll try to connect the dots by returning to what um, some of what the material in the BLDS collection contains. And I had to write this down, honestly, because um, it's, you know, this I, I'm referencing at this point, like 15 years worth of engagement with this work. And I, it's almost like there's just too much information on it in my head. But I wanted to start with this documentary, um, the poster, which is on the right, of Yawar Malku. Um, and it was a docudrama uh, that came out in 1969. I should preface this, I'm going to give a bit of history on IDS, but IDS was founded in 1966. So let's just like have that date in our heads. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about is now what happens in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, so this, this film, uh, Bolivian uh, film, drew international attention to controversial forced sterilization practices or, or the sort of implications that there was forced sterilization that was funded by the US government carried out by members of the Peace Corps in Bolivia. Um, it was accusations that were never um, uh, you know, fully fully proven, uh, sort of in a formal sense, although there's materials that indicate that there was certainly some dodgy dealings, let's say, going on, um, and there certainly was uh, family planning being offered to women who may or may not have understood what types of family planning they were, they were um, being given, um, or the sort of uh, permanent effects of some of the uh, procedures that were being done. Um, but what happened as a result of this film drawing attention to this issue was that the Peace Corps was kicked out of Bolivia in 1971, didn't return for about 15, 20 years. Um, but at that same moment in time, that this, this late 1960s moments, while the Peace Corps is being kicked out of Bolivia, 18 other countries of Latin America, with US funding and private philanthropic funding, all formed the, their first sort of national family planning association. So this, this moment of the late 1960s is a moment of a real boom in, um, in family planning and development. And the photo I have on the left is actually from Colombia in 1971 in protests related to Rockefeller Foundation involvement in the public health school in Cali, Colombia, which was also sort of experimenting with family planning outreach programs um, under the guise of you know, development and modernization. Um, and, and similarly, sort of at this moment in time, it was a very controversial issue, and uh, Rockefeller Foundation withdrew a lot of its funding as a result of, of these protests. So that's vignette number one. Vignette number two. Um, so I'm going to fast forward to 2007 when I first moved to the United Kingdom. And I happened to be working at a charity um, as an unpaid intern because I was just getting my residency called Interact Worldwide, which was actually um, a change of name from what had formerly been Population Concern and which later became folded into what became Plan UK, which is probably a charity that some of you have heard about or an INGO you've heard about. And at Interact Worldwide, which is an Africa and South Asia focused sexual reproductive health um, institution, one of the employees was giving a presentation about about its history, about some of the background, and it had um, sort of come out of a moment when um, you know eugenic societies and eugenic movements in the UK were were quite powerful political forces, and and actually formed the basis of the early family planning initiatives, um, and certainly the ones that were sort of targeting colonies uh, in that sort of interwar period. Um, 
And at this conversation, Interact Worldwide, one of the other um, colleagues at the organization hearing, being freshly reminded of the sort of underpinnings of eugenics uh, and Malthusianism and the sort of formation of what later became, you know, progressive NGO, sort of asked, why can't we just leave this history behind already? You know, why? And, and it was like a real sense of exasperation, like, can't we just let this, you know, troublesome past go? Um, and that that question really really stuck with me you know this this and and it's one that i've come across repeatedly in my work in in the development sector um and in global health is a is a real desire that people have to sort of leave history behind especially if it's sort of contentious and uh and raises uncomfortable questions another vignette so this year uh 2020 um mari stopes international or now formally known no, no formerly known as Mari Stopes International, now known as MSI Reproductive Choices, changed its name in November 2020, um, coming out of uh, sort of the Black Lives Matters protests quite specifically in response to them, but also sort of broader calls for decolonizing global health and questioning about sort of this uh, continued use of, um, you know, in, in the name of the institution itself, uh, referencing a woman who was a, a both a pioneer of family planning, but also a, you know, a, a staunch eugenicist and um, one who held some incredibly problematic racist views. Now, the quote I included um, was from the, the current director of M MSI Reproductive Choices, that is now known, um, saying, you know, we really need to look forward instead of looking back. So this was a quote in a, in a Guardian article in November of this last year. Um, and again, I think that's, you know, kind of raises these interesting, these, this, this propulsion to sort of uh, development and global health, I would argue, are both very forward looking, in, uh, you know, institutions, uh, sets of institutions, and don't normally traffic much in history, don't normally engage much, much with history. You know, the fact that Leoga and I are both sitting here talking to you today is really a reflection of the fact that this BLDS leg legacy collection has offered up an opportunity for IDS to engage more seriously um, and more critically with its historical past. But, you know, I want to sort of lay that alongside um, this question of sort of uh, what that past consists of and the desire to, to turn away from it. Uh, I should explain that the photo on the left is actually that's um, a birth control clinic, a Mari Stokes birth control clinic in, in central London. And I did actually write down because I knew I would I would lose uh, track of it completely. Some of the quotes from Mari Stokes herself and, and like Leo shared, you know, just to just to remind ourselves what we're talking about when we when we talk about eugenics, you know, the um, specifically with regards family planning, population control, and then what after 1994 and the International Conference of Population Development became known as sexual reproductive health and rights, um, of the rights bits kind of, you know, com comes and goes often in the language. Uh, but, you know, eugenics is really underpins the creation, the foundation of the formative institutions of international um, family planning. And what eugenics means, means different things in different places. Um, it doesn't, you know, it's a, it's a, like a, a pseudo scientific philosophy is one way of referring to it. But um, Leoba put had in her slide um, a quote that referenced breeding uh, in the 20s. And one of the core concepts of eugenics was that there were certain uh, means by which one could achieve better breeding. So it both included forcible sterilization of, you know, problematic uh, populations. And I'm putting that's in big air quotes, you know, sort of women whose reproduction was considered problematic um, uh, versus women whose reproduction, uh, you know, politically, societally, eugenicists wanted to encourage. Um, and, and it was, a, you know, it was an entirely racist, um, uh, you know, was, racism was embedded within the, the philosophy and the thinking. Now, a lot of people tend to sort of see eugenics as ending with World War II, with the Holocaust, with the final solution, you know, with, with the sort of like the ultimate expression of what eugenics thinking was. But in fact, quite a number of leading um, eugenicists went on to become the leaders of the very first organizations of the post-World War II UN system. Um, you know, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization, um, you know, the first uh, head of the World Health Organization, creators of NGOs, uh, quite obvious ones like International Planned Parenthood Federation. So you, eugenicists themselves and their thinking persisted and, and um, continued on long past uh, that moment when sort of narratively people see it as coming to a, a fixed conclusion. So um, what does this have to do with what is in the basement of IDS, both literally and metaphorically in the basement of IDS? I, um, I've raised these points 
because it, you know, there's so many different ways we could talk about what what the ultimately will be achieved through a closer engagement with the, the legacy collection. This is one slice of a very diverse set of materials that could offer any possible, um, you know, future research projects answering a, a whole range of questions about the nature of development and global health thought and action over a, you know, 60, 70 year window of time. Um, and family planning isn't the only thing that is in there or population surveys, but, you know, in conversation with Danny, we talked about just how, what an overwhelming amount of population census material there is. And I just thought it'd be nice to at least reflect on uh, at this moment in time, why is that? Why, why, why is that what was saved? Um, as as Leoba pointed out in her talk, she entered into the Colonial Archives Project asking from the beginning these questions about, you know, why was the material that was saved, saved? And what did the authors of that material hope for future generations to gain? What does the organization of it and the collection of it tell us about that moment in time? Um, so the collection of materials, um, as we pointed out, you know, I want to go back to this moment of Yawar Malku and give a little, um, you know, probably already started reading it, a whistle stop history, just to position you at least chronologically at the moment of IDS's founding, um, sort of what was going on in the moment it sort of entered into the frame. And admittedly, what I'm talking about is, is, is you know, very a very U.S. dominated uh, sector within global health and development because the U.S. money was was both U.S. government money and money from philanthropic organizations like Rockefeller and Ford Foundation, both U.S. based, were really the dominant um, financiers of international family planning initiatives. But the U.K. had a very important role within all of this as well. So I don't like let's not forget that. Um, but in the little whistle stop history, just to give you a sense of where IDS comes in. It comes in sort of mid to the end of the UN's launching of the development decade. And this is, you know, in 1961, you have the creation of USAID and the Alliance for Progress, and you have a very explicit political uh, and policy related link between economic development, modernization, and population policies. Population policies, possibly meaning control, possibly meaning concerted efforts to um, ramp up. Uh, modern uh, family planning methods or the use of modern family planning methods amongst women living in um, what we now call low and middle income country context, but at the time, which were called women living in the third world. Um, so the Institute of Development Studies comes on board in 1966 that just after that year, the World Bank under Robert McNamara pursues population policy development again that explicitly links family planning as a means to achieve economic development. And as part of that, you begin to see the generation of the data, the metrics on which these future sort of planning processes and decision making will take place. And that's that's kind of later in the time period that we're now looking at. But this is why you have this sudden boom of census materials and a documenting of what do these countries contain, whether they're immediately post-independent or in Latin America in the context of you know military dictatorships in the Southern Cone, an attempt to map out the constitution of any given sort of national space and population terms, but also the fertility patterns within those spaces and also the fertility patterns between urban and rural spaces and, you know, levels of education. And, and as Danny points out, the censuses get increasingly nuanced as the years go on in terms of how exactly they're framing um, reproductive choices and reproductive behavior patterns. Uh, 1968, we have a year of global rebellion. Um, this is, you know, again, right around the time that we've um, gone back to the Yawar Malku uh, film. So there was, you know, equal to sort of dominant narratives, a lot of pushback from people living in the countries that were targeted by these interventions. Um, so it was not like a simple, you know, sort of a core periphery, you know, sort of a decision making processes. There was a lot of contestation, a lot of negotiation going on. Creation of UNFPA in 1969. And then I can see Jeremy's waving his arm. So I must, um, uh, I'm going to wrap up here quickly with a few things from the BLDS collection. So Danny's already shared some images, but I just wanted to, again, point out that, you know, uh, there are concrete historical reasons that there is so much attention on family planning and in, in archives of development studies. And I think the point that I really want to make here at the end um, is a cautionary statement and a provocation. And, you know, Leo has already asked this question in a way about who gets to tell the stories of what lives in archives. And to be fair, BLDS is not an archive. Um, I don't want to upset Richard Wagg, who would get very upset with me if I called it an archive. It's a legacy collection. 
but who gets to tell the stories of what lives in these places? And I would say that, you know, the, the point of the BLDS collection, you know, and, and the future hoped for digitization of much of it material is that anybody who wants to engage with it can tell the story of what lives in these collections. So while it has lived in the basement and lived in a, in a, in a space that has not been accessible to a broad public, um, moving forward, going forward, hopefully that is what it will come to be, in which instance, um, the history belongs to whoever wants to begin to make sense of it and engage with it. And the cautionary statement I want to make, and I'll end here so we can have time for Q&A, and it, I, I'm sort of reflecting and repeating a little bit what Leoba said, but there is a tendency, I think, that I've witnessed over the time that I've been working in these fields of global health and development to use history and problematic histories in particular as an opportunity to take the moral high ground in the contemporary moment to sort of distance contemporary practices and actions from this um, work in the past. And certainly in sexual reproductive health, uh, people have done that to a great extent. Um, and, and in doing so, dishonestly, I think, or at least disingenuously, fail to recognize some of the things that are in fact continuing, the continuities. So it's quite easy to see the ruptures. Um, people are less inclined to see the continuities. And I think that this BLDS legacy um, collection is an opportunity to look at both. And, and both can exist at the same time. Um, and again, Leoba pointed this out, you know, there's, there's contradictions inherent in this work and inherent in these histories, but our job and our responsibility is to be able to hold that tension and hold it in a productive way. Um, and I'm gonna end there. So we've got time for everyone who's sitting in the room to um, come forward with your questions and provocations. So thank you and apologies for running slightly over. <laughs> oh, that, that was fine, Erica, thanks. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yes, unmute myself. Sorry for the little waving. That was my technique to say, um, uh, bringing to the conclusion, but that was perfect. Thanks for the three uh, speakers. It was really uh, fascinating. Um, and I'm looking forward to some questions. Uh, there are so many topics to look at, whether it's just in terms of conceptualizing just the meaning of history, you know, between continuity and change. How do we revisit that? Uh, just in terms of languages, uh, just in terms of the language use, you know, what type of language was used in the past, how, how can we understand it? Um, in terms of uh, the sort of decolonial moment. And in some ways, what was interesting was also this idea of to what extent it should not just be a moment, you know, this idea of revisiting, not just for the sake of revisiting, but for the sake of, of, of change. So. Uh, so many aspects, also just you as, and I'm thinking of the students here in the room, just you in terms of learning, uh, because I feel that in development studies we lack sometimes this, 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 this use of archive and just learning how to use archives for your own research and for your own dissertation. So that's also pr probably something that you could ask um, all these distinguished speakers of their experience of you using archives. So please shoot your questions. <laughs> So, so much material. Um, also, family, family planning, of course. Um, position. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm just going to. Yeah. It's getting confusing. <laughs> so, any questions, clarifications you have? On the main chat, I can't see anything. I don't know if any of you have. No, I might offer a provocation of my own, though, because actually there was something that you just said, Jeremy, that I had meant to point out um, in returning to this present moment and this question specifically about language. So when you're working historically with these materials, you know, obviously the language is, is can be highly offensive. It's, it's contentious. It's not what we're using in the in the present moment. But when you're referring to it as a historian, you have to, you know, at least when I'm talking out loud, it's like, how many times am I going to use air quotes? But I also want to make it very clear that, you know, speaking about what has been said by past actors and how things are were referred to in that historical moment, which is actually important to understand those transitions of language over time. Um, but, you know, Leo and I were having a chat about this just the other day. There's, there's also sort of sometimes an unthinking use of past language in a way that can be um, 
you know, really upsetting for people who are working in these fields now. And I think that, you know, right now we're at a moment where there's so many questions about what is going to be the future language in both development and global health, which is itself a contested term at this point. I mean, as is development, frankly. So, you know, there's a lot of I think there's a lot that's on the table right now from this sort of about what um, what kinds of future languages can call into being. There is a chat question, though. Yes, there's, so there's, we've got two questions. One, uh, uh, I, I think I'll, I'll ask uh, Danny to reply, which is, what are the other areas covered by the archive sort of beyond uh, sort of, uh, public health? And then there's another question, which I guess, um, uh, Erica probably could, could, could answer, is that has anything been written about the colonial history of ideas? So perhaps, Danny, perhaps you can uh, clarify a bit what are the contents for, for, for the audience in terms of uh, the, the RDS archives? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I mean, the they span across like uh, like a vast variety of different subjects. Um, and when we were starting to to think about how to catalog them and how to present the metadata, um, we picked out a series of themes which. Uh, um, we had about 20 themes or so, which were the main subjects. Um, but I'm just thinking of things that were most interesting we've come across and I've been talking about recently. Yesterday, I did some teaching uh, on one of the courses here at Sussex, and we were helping out. They were they, what they were interested in there was liberation and liberation movements. And there's a huge amount of material there because obviously we're covering a bunch of different countries who many of whom are either coming to independence in this period or just post independence, or in the case of the Latin American countries. Obviously Obviously, uh, there's struggles against military dictatorships. So that's a whole strand of material that's really, really fascinating to compare across different continents and different countries. Um, another subject that is covered in a great deal of detail in different ways, uh, education and education programs. Um, and so, again, we've got a lot of material there from, from different countries and from a mixture from government departments and so ministries of education, but also from international organizations organizations where these are NGOs and their kind of interventions in, in, in different countries that um, from the collection. Um, and I, I guess the like another area which might not be as like super interesting to um, to people on the surface is there's a huge amount on economics. So <laughs> there are, we, for, in the same way that there are these big collections of censuses, we also have big runs of budgets and budget statements for all the countries as well. Again, material that in many cases seems quite dry, but if it's not available elsewhere or when it's looked at in context, um, then it's really, really fascinating. Um, and just lastly, sorry, that's a very, very long answer uh, to that question there, but one of the we have a bunch of in our international organizations in the non-official serials we have um a great deal of material which is from the uh, what you might call the non-aligned movement or in some instances i guess is inspired by kind of uh um uh, the, the 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 second world the the, the kind of uh, Soviet Union and communist countries so there's a great run of tricontinental magazines and publications which all originate from Cuba which the contents of which some of which might be controversial the aesthetic of which is beautiful so it's worth looking at in itself and there's also a great run of journals and serials from southern Africa and I was just looking at those from the 70s and 80s as a fantastic uh, run of Vow the Voices of Women which is the ANC women's section publication um which is really it's a perfect piece of ephemera really because it's showing you just a microcosm of what was happening in the 80s just at the crux when the the, the struggle is really kind of heating up so i guess they're just little snapshots but that's the sort of thing we have fascinating danny uh and i loved in your powerpoint all these uh, images some of them that you didn't comment on fanning fanny planning in french that made me laugh too um uh, fantastic um erica do, do, any colonial history of ideas or is that your next project? <laughs> yeah, honestly, I can't wait for this collection to be cataloged and, and um, accessible because, you know, having spent time in it before when it was quite dusty and, and a little scary in places down there. <laughs> <laughs> 
And there were a lot of a lot of bugs running around before they've sort of got you know it's gotten cleaned up um materials are, are being safeguarded and i am so excited to to dive back in to be honest so but no uh you know people have certainly um members of ids uh who have been at ids for a long time have written historical reflections on their past work i don't you know i'm un i'm unaware as of yet of a of a critical history of ids written by an outsider to the institution um although increasingly this period of development in global health is getting historical attention it's also a relatively new field of study you know histories of global health or international public health there's a lot of histories of medicine that kind of come up through that um to the creation of the world war you know sort of the the Bretton woods institutions and there's a lot of institutional histories of like specific institutions so um, whether done by the institutions themselves, which is, you know, like hit World Bank telling its own history or um, versus, you know, critical uh, reflections on those institutions by by sort of historians external to the institutions. But it's it's I would say a lot of this is quite new, really. Um, and I mean, Leoba might want to weigh in on that as well. But I see that um, Haley had a question about uh, pandemic histories and and some of Leoba's more recent works. So and maybe maybe you'd like to talk about sort of the expansion of this of this field of study of let's say critical histories of development and global health in a, the latter half of the 20th century let's say yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah Lyoba, i was going to call you actually with uh, Haley's question on obviously in the sort of covid uh, context about your, your sort of experience of going through uh, the uh, london school archives uh, around sort of epidemic narratives and uh, what, what have you found related to that? Uh, if you could share that uh, with us, and then and then for all of you afterwards, I'll come back to Gautier from for a question. Sorry, from Gautier, essentially on uh, on when when we think of these moments in some ways in in the way that history has been done, the sixties, the independence area, this sort of glorification of this area, and a bit this romanticization in some ways. Do we do we not see? Uh, portrayed as sort of critical juncture, don't we see actually not so much change in the sort of before and after in terms of archives, in terms of whether in terms of language used and, and so on, and in terms of framing, or is there a really radical way of, of understanding it? A much bigger question, I think, which I'll open to the three of you, but uh, um, uh, Yoba, if you want to tackle the first one first. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, it's such a good question. Um, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's sort of that there are definitely certain parallels between between how um, how COVID has unfolded in the public imagination and and scientific and what I would argue pseudo scientific narratives around trying to explain health difference um, between and I'm thinking mostly of, of, of I guess. Uh, a UK or, or or US context trying to explain health difference um, between um, white people and people of African descent or black people. Um, what's interesting is that in the LSHGM archives, and I mean this is this is fairly common in sort of archives um, that that cover health and the politics of health in the period between. I, I think I'd, I'd argue that the turn of the twentieth century, when race and the race question becomes really prevalent in in in, in colonial policies um, in Europe, um, through a rise in, in sort of African middle classes and 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 access to education by. Um, by 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 African colonized populations and then sort of the need to differentiate ourselves as 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 the white colonial settlers from from the local population. Um, so I'm rambling now. What I meant to say um, was that um, the idea that that black people and people of African descent and African people are biologically or genetically different from white people. I think it's a really important one that. Um, is, is, is very present in the archives and then I would argue has come up again and again last year, especially when 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 we were first confronted with the fact that um, that people of African descent and and Afro-Caribbean descent um, um, were dying at, at much higher rates of COVID-19 in the UK and in the US than white people. And I think what's dangerous there and 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 what I think circulates and sort of comes back again and again is is 
is again the the temptation to to look at race rather than racism and so that even in the ways in which in which those hypotheses and and scientific theories that that sprung up last year have been refuted the idea of, of race that race is is a biological or, or a genetic um essence and, and that it exists that it's not a that it's not an that it's not an invention is really really dangerous i think that's that's an important parallel um, i think there's also i think i think what COVID shows is, is sort of how yeah how we how we go back to the same tropes and ideas around that that, that we feel comfortable with around um, um other other bodies and other health and other health systems and i remember one other thing that that came up last year was that um that people were sort of predicting the rise of, 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 of an African COVID pandemic, which then didn't come. And then, and then, then um, explanations for why it didn't come or didn't, I guess, like manifest as badly as, 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 as European scientists or North American scientists had predicted was that was African climate and African weather and that because it was hot and because the, the heat sort of protected people from, from COVID-19 infection. And again, the climate is like a really old colonial trope to describe and, and explain um, um, different differences in health expectations and health outcomes um, in Africa and, and I'm sure also, also in Asia and, and, and South America, which I'm less familiar with. So yeah, I think that, and I could probably go on, there's sort of, yeah, things that ideas and, and prejudices and, and, and conceptions of, of other health and other bodies that come around again and again and again and sort of, I guess, showcase racism's versatility and, and that we use, so we have to like adapt our strategies to beating back um, 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 those ideas. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm not going to point to a particular panelist. As I said, there's Gucci's question. I'll also bring in two other questions and you can jump in uh, uh, the three of you according to which question you want to answer, or not specifically your questions. But the, so the, there's one from Lydia, which is essentially about the, the sort of politics of archive. Isn't there a problem in the sense that the archives are so selective in some ways that they don't show this type of hidden history or marginalized history in some ways that you were mentioning it? So how to deal with this dilemma? And this other one from um, uh, Colin, which is essentially, well, what, what can we do in some ways to, 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 to sort of change the perception uh, of people have of their past. I, I guess in some ways how archives are useful in that. And I, I guess the, the, the sort of more fundamental point behind is that what all of you have covered in some ways is that, that there's a position right now where everybody's sort of comfortable with a, a political correctness. But when we revisit the past, there's this tension and people feel uneasy and say, well, okay, these were things from the past, but now we are all going forward. So that's a really important tension in some ways. So I don't know if I've done justice to the questions, but would you like any of you uh, would like to? I mean, I was I was I was sitting here sort of like because I only because I could pull it up and see Gautier's, although now I'll try to keep the other um, Lydia's as well in mind. Uh, and actually, Lydia's given me a good lead in because um, it was actually one of the things that we talked about when we did the methods week on historical methods for IDS last year, which we're talking about reprising this year. We'll see what our capacity is. But that was one of the things we talked about that, you know, his, because people who haven't done historical work, or maybe they've only done it in places where um, high, you know, high levels of resources are available, might not be familiar with what it is to be doing historical work and in, in, um, places where the resources were not there to, to maintain these records and sort of the how one has to actually go about finding materials in a lot of different ways, but also that the official materials might be um, represent just one political viewpoint. You know, what was saved might be simply, you know, whoever won the war or whoever, you know, achieved the military dictatorship and burned everything else down. So oftentimes this is where sort of oral history comes into play or sort of other forms of, you know, even, um, more participatory collaborative forms of history meaning making with with communities or with individuals because you can't it's not all sitting there in the basement I mean that's just like one slice of of sort of a larger story if I if I as a historian were to engage with the material there I would also be engaging with both a lot of other collections of materials as well as you know talking to people um tra traveling to places you know working working with a perhaps a collaborative set of international um 
historians who are all sort of more familiar with what's going on in a bunch of different places. Um, so increasingly, there's more types of, you know, co-produced work that looks like that within history, but that was less common in the past. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to sort of do that. So I guess I would just point out merely that, you know, while we're very excited about the BLDS Legacy Collection, what it is is a is a jumping off point um, that nobody's sort of work should consist, uh, begin and end only there. I would sort of, um, I guess, you know, recommend that. But Gautier has this this point about um, language and framings and critical junctures, and I, I think, you know, and there and and when you study these changes over long periods of time, you know, there are moments where suddenly things are changing really fast, and then there are things are changing very slowly, and there are points of juncture. But then I think that when you bring that that type of historical research into fields of practice that are incredibly future oriented in which there's a very marginalized tiny space for the people who might speak to continuities or problematic continuities or want to reflect upon past actions or even past failures i think it's more that um there's this running forward you know it's like the the, the field is constantly running forward and so there's very little space for that type of critical reflection um, so the junctures can only really be seen quite quite long after the fact, you know, even if it feels like at the moment we're living in one. Um, and I, I think uh, Gautier should come to the talk that I'm going to give next week on critical histories of nutrition, because one of the junctures I didn't go into in great depth here, but there's a lot of overlap between nutrition and development action and family planning and population, because they're both kind of building on um, similar uh, concepts of um, Malthusianism and eugenics. There were sort of some of those ideas were circulating at least at the UN international level, international actor level. And yet, and this is the part that requires a lot more historical work to do it. So there's less sort of to pull from. There's a lot of counter narratives or countervailing perspectives on those same processes. Um, so it could be the voices of actors who are actually quite um, vocal in their contestation of those um, framings at the time, but they've been quote unquote lost to history. We're less aware of them now, but you know, increasingly that is the work that historians are doing or bringing those alternative voices back into the present moment that have, that have been, um, that, that, that lost, you know, they were the, they were the lions in the, in the, um, sort of trajectory of, of development and global health, um, as it sort of proceeded forward. So I think that is also the job of historians is to look harder, um, and, and be, critically aware of that these are negotiated processes and the, the dynamics of power and whose knowledge counted and then whose knowledge got saved um, very much informs what what one finds when you go you know, looking at these materials. It doesn't quite answer Gautier's question. I know there's like an inflection point, but um, there's certainly periods in which there's a lot of inflections happening in 58 to 74 in which the 60s that I just talked about was one period that people have looked at as being sort of a rise and fall of alternative um, well, there was the new international economic order, there are new ideas about development and new ideas uh, that were coming from in, you know, this post independence moment that that didn't ultimately um, achieve the traction that they could have at that moment in time for a lot of reasons. Just to pick up on what Eric is saying there, I, I'm not a historian, so I'm not an expert on this, but just from working through the collections, I think that you can see these, I think it's really fascinating to see these transitions and these changes in terms of, of language. Um, for instance, when you go across a, bulk, a bunch of different countries, you can see changes in the names of departments and government departments as different things become important. You can see a move, for instance, from like five-year plans and talk of independence and liberation and economic nationalism to be kind of replaced by talk more about trade and globalization. You can start to see the involvement in the publications of, of different organizations. So publications that are co-authored with the World Bank or the World Health Organization. And these crop up at, again, particular kind of in different decades. Um, all of that is a very, from a very surface looking at them, obviously I'm looking at each item and cataloging it, not necessarily reading in depth, but I think that you, there's a real scope there for comparative studies. Um, with, with Lydia's question about how to construct more inclusive histories from the partial data i mean i think it's a great question and it's a really hard one uh, all not all but one of the things i think that will hopefully be helpful coming out of our project is at the moment we don't even know what's there in the basement which as erica said is a jumping off point if we're able to have catalogued and described that then i think it will be clearer what it covers and what it doesn't cover and the sort of voices that are there and hopefully that will provide that will be helpful in starting to then think well what else should we where else should we be going um 
what in, in Gerardo's questions in the chat there, I guess, as well about oral history and sound archives. How should we be using histories of that sorts to complement the sort of history that has come out of the, the BLDS basement? So I guess that's not a great solution, but maybe that's a, 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 the steps that need to be taken in order to start to try and address this. But, but Danny, just, just one clarification on that. Is there, on the BLDS collection, do we have beyond written archives, are, are there sort of films or photographs or other, other type of collections in it? Yeah. Yeah, so just, I guess just to, as Erica rightly clarified before, if, and Rich is probably here as well, it's definitely not an archive. Um, but uh, and as I think Melissa was saying in the chat as well, so what we're covering doesn't include the IDS's own institutional archive. So it's slightly it's a, telling the story about IDS at one step removed, um, and in the there are a bunch of all the materials that are there, not part of this project. Um, which I think are mostly written, may also uh, encompass other sorts of material and certainly encompass archival material. But I'm pretty sure that within the scope of BLDS, it's all written. That doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't be looking for uh, other types of archive that could be complementing that. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, but I wanted to just come back to, to, to this question that was asked by uh, Colin, essentially on, because you, you, you sort of share these, uh, these polls about the, the sort of perception of, of people about the past and he's asking this question of uh, in, in some ways how can we use I mean in, in some ways in your experience what has changed in some ways at the London School of Hygiene <laughs> just to put it provocatively. <laughs> that is a very tricky and highly politically charged question. Um, yeah what has changed? Um, I mean I think and I, I wouldn't really say that this is down to the to the colonial history project. I think it's 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 one of those moments in which um, an institutional history sort of intersected with with broader societal histories. And and I think the Black Lives Matter movement has had a much bigger impact on um, the conversations that are happening at um, at um, the London School than the than the colonial history project. Again, I think that has a lot to do with how these projects are set up, like my project was set up um, sort of on, on quite quite a small scale um, and, and without much room for public engagements, which, which obviously has an influence on, on the conversations that we can have. Um, in terms of countering, I guess, um, the, the, the understanding of, of colonial histories in, in, in British societies. So I, I saw there was a question about the, the, the culture wars, I guess the, the, the government's current um, attempt to, well, I would argue, tell very one-sided histories that, that tend to glorify colonialism rather than, than be critical of it. Um, I, think, I think that two things, I think um, in terms of the, the culture wars, what's, it, what's important to, to sort of bear in mind that quite often, I think these things are a distraction and that what we should focus on is, is not the government's attempts to shut down archives or sort of forbid research into the colonial countryside, but what we, or, or, or whether statues can, can, can stay up or not, what we, what we should focus on are sort of structural inequalities and the ways in which they shape um, the experiences of, of people of color um, in the UK today. Um, in terms of changing perceptions around colonialism, that's really difficult and tricky. And I think it's, I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not British and I don't want to offend anyone, but I grew up in continental Europe and I often think there's, there's sort of something islandish around, around maybe, maybe a, an increased wish to hang on to, to, um, to, to glorified versions of the past. I grew up in Germany where that simply wasn't possible. Um, and, and it's good that that wasn't possible because it shouldn't be possible. And I think maybe sort of the, the outside pressure that was applied on, on Germany in the, in the, 50s and 60s, 60s of, of not being able to, to tell ourselves glorified versions of the past or, or, or hush up <laughs> the, the, the many atrocities that the German government was responsible for need to sort of, that, that needs to happen with colonialism more and, and, and the, the violence and the, the genocides that were, um, that were um, 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 conducted is the wrong word, but that happened, um, happened under colonial governments. But then that means, getting rid of Winston Churchill on the five part notes. And I don't 
I don't see that that happening um, anytime soon, unfortunately. Sorry, I'm always a bit depressing um, <laughs> when talking about this. I mean, I think there's another question from Gauthier, which is it's always pushing a bit from what what I was saying, which is basically. Did you f face any sort of um, open institutional hostility with, in terms of your work, or what was possible, what was impossible, what, what where were the barriers, in terms of what you were doing, uh, in some ways? The yeah. other one, if I may, the other one that was, I was thinking about it, but I, I didn't know how to position myself when, it, and I, I guess your own history perhaps explains it. The, your use of the concept responsible history, mm. uh, which is. Which is an interesting one, but uh, and I understand I, I I don't like the balanced approach either. But responsible history that's uh, that, that's intriguing also. <laughs> Creates a lot of uh, ethical dilemmas in my mind. Anyway, uh, but um, uh, 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 well anyway. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I want Libra to be on the spot about like sort of the because I asked her to come and talk about LSHGM and I having sat with her and, and participated in, you know, so the decolonizing global health work within LSHTM and the time that I was there, um, you know, these are, they're very uncomfortable conversations for um, a portion of the institution. Not everyone is on board with asking these tough questions and it, it does, it is emotional work. And so I recognize and to sort of Melissa's point that the work that Leoba was doing is very distinct from what the BLDS legacy collection represents. I mean, that is an archive of an institution, is an institutional history that has been saved. Um, BLDS, the way that those materials came into being was quite different, but that also, you know, deserves further critical historical reflection. You know, is a lot of the materials, some of them appear to be, you know, sort of reflect who the key thinkers were in the institution at a given moment in time, and therefore they wanted certain materials brought and saved, or which ge which geographies were receiving sort of uh, overseas development attention at a given moment in time, and then that kind of drops off, and the materials drop off. So you know, you can kind of see these patterns as well about like. The, that sort of reflect on the life of, of the Institute of Development Studies as an institution, even if it isn't an institutional archive as such, the collections are still telling us a certain story about um, the type of thinking that, you know, the type of practice that was um, centered on that, on that, on the institution. But I do think that, um, I guess the point I was trying to make by talking about, like, maybe perhaps a a, a specifically controversial aspect of past development action, which is, you know, population control and, and sterilization campaigns is being like particularly provocative. It, sometimes the provocations are a good place to start because they're the, it's a little easier to sort of enter into talking about what was, um, you know, looking at the racism in a, in a more direct way, whereas other practices, it's, a, it's more hidden. Um, or at least hidden in terms of the text and the way things were written and can be harder to sort of unpick. And, and actually, that was the thing I wanted to say to Gautier and, and, and another person asked about, like, you know, obviously, Leo and I are both reflecting our own backgrounds as historians of health. Or at least, I mean, that's that's a lot of the focus of, of, of recent work um, versus development in its broadest sense, which involves all these other sectors that, that Danny himself mentioned. But in health, and the practice of health and in the current practice of global health, you know, it's so often that the um, biomedical, you know, sort of sci scientific constructions of truth trump any other formulation of what the truth might be. And it's really hard to fight against that, even though, you know, when science presents itself as objective, it, it, it can be very difficult to sort of counter that objectivity, though Leo has just pointed out that the underpinnings of the very um, scientific endeavors that, you know, under the umbrella of LSHGM were, were um, you know, entirely problematic in their origins and they were they were subjective they were not objective um you know the investment in hookworm was not a um you know they may have been carrying out scientific investigations using scientific methods but the choice to focus on hookworm was a political choice and it was an economic choice um and so that's that's i think part of what history allows us to see a little bit more clearly it's sometimes harder to see those patterns in the present day though not for many of my colleagues i would say at ids because i think so many people focus on power and and politics and unruly politics so um yeah i think there's there's uh, but that's less that's less of a dominant trend in global health that kind of attention to countervailing narratives Thank you. Um, I can I, yeah, of course, of course. Can I just um, um, 
I was, yeah, I was just thinking about Gutierrez's question. Um, and um, yeah, um, I think, and, and I think it, it ties back in with, with, with what I said about sort of distractions and, and, and I guess the government's current attempts to, um, to, to shut down or, or at times intimidate in, in, yeah, intimidate people doing critical colonial histories. Um, I think, and 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 that's happening, and that's very serious, and I think that that deserves attention. But I think what what is almost what I find what deserves attention, and and I think maybe that's more the case of of, of LSHTM, um, um, aren't open hostilities or sort of people saying shut this down or you shouldn't do this or or any of those things. I think. I think what what maybe the, the biggest enemy of 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 doing critical um, anti-colonial institutional histories or history research is or are are um, how to put it are, are are people's people's wish or people's desire to be comforted and and I think, and again, that's sort of where the emotional burden comes back on, because if you if you write the history or you 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 find something in the archives and you present it, and and then and that's also the the but also ism that I was talking about at the beginning in my presentation. That way, when you're constantly confronted with, but but what about this? And like, but weren't they also nice? And but surely there was there was discontent and there was sort of there were subversive actions and and sort of the 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 constant yeah the constant push or, 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 or willingness to be comforted by, I would argue, a, a, a big proportion of, 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 of the staff. And I wouldn't say that this is only the case at, at LSHGM. I think this is probably the case in, in a lot of institutions because it's uncomfortable. And of course, like if I have the choice, then I would rather see that, um, that, that my ancestors or the people who have come and worked before me have done great social justice work. So I think, I think, that maybe that maybe is is a not a bigger problem, but as as big a problem as sort of the yeah the open hostilities that, that the government is engaging in uh, in not anything, but um, yeah that that I haven't I haven't um, um, been confronted with luckily. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm aware of the time, and I can't see uh, sort of any more questions. But I, I I'm going to instrumentalize it a bit because I just feel also as a I was trained as a historian and I, I just feel that in development studies uh, and in many, in some ways we're talking about revisiting, reopening archives and, and so on, which shows something about sort of forgotten side of history as history <laughs> in some ways, <laughs> and if it makes sense. And how can we, in some ways, we, we got all these students, how can, just a few words from all of you perhaps, how can we encourage students in development studies to use a bit more I know they're not archives, uh, Danny, I, I'll be careful, but more not just linked to BLDS, but in general, how can you encourage more uh, students to, to, to use archives in their work? Uh, it, it, perhaps it's something we could sort of end of, um, or, or is there any other thoughts? But I just feel it's something that is something that is important. I have to come in, and then Leo, then Danny, please say, but I think the experience of a lot of historical work is that it's, it's it's decorative to the other type of work that is being done certainly in the spaces of global health and development it's often you know it's the first paragraph of the paper it's it's context and there is very little actual funding that goes towards doing the actual work <laughs> to answer the questions some of which have been posed here today and including you know within LSHM, this this was the the project that leoba did was it was very time bound it was very small um, and contained it wasn't some sort of like hugely funded piece of research so I think one, there's the issue that it's it, it's very underfunded and it's not seen as something of value enough to embed it within the practices of these places that are otherwise doing other types of research. Um, and I also think that a lot of people therefore aren't familiar with the range of methods or do think that the history is, you know, I mean, oftentimes when I've talked to students across a range of both development, global health and, and you know, um, BSMS and UCL, different institutions about, about the value of history. I mean, I do feel like a broken record, but a lot of it is 
starts from a starting point of saying that it's not a fixed thing. Like history isn't like it's not in a book and therefore it is written and it is done. It's continually evolving and dynamic and we're always revisiting it in the political moment that we're in. But you have to understand what that means to do that work. And I think that a lot of people just, you know, the last time they engaged seriously with history was was maybe in like secondary school and haven't really done it since. So I think there's also um, a lot to be gained from some of the methods of history, which above all else are critical readings of text and language. And it's a, um, an unpicking of everything's surface to get underneath the surface. I think that's how I think about what it's given me, even in my practice as an anthropologist or like contemporary development, it's the fact that you're trained and the training is to uh, n not take, well, it depends on your training, but you know, at least I'd say a little bit and I would share that training of not taking anything at face value and, and, and digging behind and digging underneath the layers to find out what exactly it is that you're looking at and how it came to be whether it's in your hands physically as a piece of text or as a conversation or it's a recording, you know, but, but there's a real um, attention to how things come to be. And, and, um, and also, yeah, why, like what the, what the intention was behind their existence. Leoba, what, I don't know. I want to hear what Leoba has to say about Yeah. Um, I, I yeah, fully agree with what you said, Erica. Um, I don't know if this is helpful or not, but um, I'm I'm not a trained historian. I am I'm a social scientist. I have degrees in, in sociology, and my PhD was in, in, in sort of critical geographies of global health. But I think history, to me, and this may or may not be helpful. I think sometimes people sort of think, oh, history. What what what? Why should I engage in history? I'm not a historian, and I'm just say neither am I. But um, I think history is is such a powerful tool, um, especially if especially in the areas in which we're working, which is sort of to to I guess counter and 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 lessen social inequities, and 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 especially doing that work on a global scale. We need histories because because we we because they they offer us uh, they offer us, offer us a perspective on on what has been tried before and and they also show us again sort of like in which way power always operates in sort of recurring and 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 but also ever changing ways and 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 unless we understand that i think we're very likely to sort of recommit the the the, the sins or the the mistakes of the past so um yeah i just think that history is is such a fantastic and important tool um to anyone working in development or global health or yeah, any sort of yeah, critical applied disciplines really. Any last word? Yeah, um, I don't know if it's it merits being a last word, uh, and I'm no expert on on teaching at all. But just from the tiny amount that we've been involved with with the project, um, we've been like speaking to students who are not necessarily historians and going along with my colleagues um, from mass observation who do the introduction to the archives obviously it's been done virtually at the moment then just that little introduction to like historical methods and the sort of sources you might have and how you'd use them um, it seems to me that the students are really really receptive and often it's really new to them you, you might think that people know more about this than they do and so I guess on a really prosaic level the more that could be integrated not just in history courses but in the humanities and then also for people who are studying the sciences as well then it's all applicable and I think that would make it more likely to avoid the sort of situation that Erica was describing where you have your first paragraph and then that's it and you're done um, so the more more that that could be that could be done like Sussex ought I mean again I'm to going totally off script here but my understanding is in the past this was one of the intentions of what sort of place Sussex was meant to be like it would be great to have more of that here and elsewhere Fantastic. Thanks, Danny. Uh, well, I would like to thank uh, the panel. It was it was really great. Uh, I'm hoping you all enjoyed it. I can see that uh, from the comments, uh, people seem to found that really, really interesting. Um, um, Jeremy, can I make a last plug? Just for anybody who wants to hear more history or learn more history, please do come to the seminar that will be taking place next Thursday between two and four, where I'll be presenting on a paper I was working on with Nick Nisbet and Stuart Gillespie, which is a critical interrogation of the global nutrition sector. So if you want to learn more about history, come to that too. Go, go, go for it. Leo, Leoba, any announcements? <laughs> Daddy, no? We're all good. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, have a lovely afternoon. And um, thanks, and bye bye. <laughs>
Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Leoba. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Cheers, Leoba. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Thanks we for really sharing, Jeremy. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. Bye.